queue and then we'll be off and running. Got it. Excellent. Okay. Dr. Deborah Korn, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you, David. It's wonderful to be here with you. Well, I'm so glad to have you on here. Uh, you're one of the two authors of the 22 book, Every Memory Deserves Respect, The Proven Trauma Therapy with the Power to Heal. It's a powerful title, I must say. <laughs> the big promise in there. Yeah. Uh, um, well, your bio describes you as one, as a pioneer in the world of EMDR. What can you tell us about that? How how did you get the status of being a pioneer? <laughs> yeah. Well, my book publicist is quite generous in using oh, okay. <laughs> in using this word to describe me. Yeah. But uh, it's true that I have been involved with EMDR uh, since the very early days. Um, Dr. Francine Shapiro, the developer of EMDR published uh, the first paper, the first clinical outcome study looking at the efficacy of EMDR in 1989. And I was trained in EMDR by Dr. Shapiro in 1991, 1992. Oh, and at the time of my introductory EMDR training, I was the clinical director of an inpatient psychiatric unit specializing in the treatment of uh, women recovering from both acute and chronic trauma. And um, so we're talking about PTSD, complex PTSD, dissociative disorders, personality disorders. I was treating women struggling with severe suicidal ideation and self-injury, eating disorders, addictions. Uh, you know, some of them had made serious suicide attempts. And I used EMDR every single day, starting the day after I completed my training over yeah. many years on this inpatient unit. And you know, my patients were my earliest teachers and collaborators, and I quickly learned how to adapt Dr. Shapiro's basic protocol when working with individuals who had endured uh, prolonged and repeated trauma, you know, those who had significant childhood abuse and neglect. What drew you to EMDR? What were you doing before uh, in treating those people before you found EMDR? And by the way, I interviewed Dr. Shapiro early on. And um, I didn't, if I, I gather she's passed on and I'm not sure when that happened. Yes. <clears throat> but I'm going to put a link to that in interview in our show notes. I just want our, our audience to Lovely. know that they can find a link to that early interview with her. Yeah. But what, what, what were you doing before you discovered EMDR? Well, you know, 30 years ago, um, in the summer uh -huh. of 1991, I actually traveled to Denver, Colorado to visit my graduate school mentor, Andy Sweet. Um, I had graduated with a doctorate from the University of Denver School of Professional Psychology in 1989. And basically Andy had taught uh, me everything I knew about working with trauma survivors. And I was there telling him how frustrated I was with the limitations of the treatment models available to me when treating chronic trauma survivors. Uh, you know, teaching patients a raft of cognitive behavioral coping skills, positive self-talk, distraction, challenging right. distorted thinking, helping them to manage their symptoms uh, seemed necessary, but not sufficient. It um, wasn't and they, doing it. It wasn't doing the job. It wasn't doing it. <laughs> you know, they were typically able to achieve some degree of short-term relief, but a cure for their complicated symptoms and their distress somehow seemed elusive to them and to me. And, um, you know, memories associated with fear and shame and helplessness would just continue to get reactivated, requiring, you know, uh, ongoing top-down efforts to manage. And yeah. more now you just you, you, you just use the word cure. That's a very rare word in yeah. psychotherapy, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so do you uh -huh. stand behind that? <laughs> I stand behind it. I mean, I... I specifically chose that word in making okay. that statement. Um, you know, with EMDR, we are able to knock out the diagnosis of PTSD. We're able to knock out the diagnosis of complex PTSD. And we're able to move beyond, you know, just simply relieving folks of their symptoms, decreasing the negative. We're able to increase the positive. They're able to have joy and presence in their lives. Um, and, you know, at the time, that I was meeting with Andy and complaining about the limitations, I really knew that we could do better. And, you know, he said to me, um, Debbie, you need to listen to me. 
you know, there's this new therapy called EMDR and it's something quite unique. It looks and sounds kind of wacky, <laughs> and, but I'm getting remarkable results with it. You know, you have to go and get trained in it and you have to run. You cannot walk. Um, <laughs> and so I ran and I got yeah. trained with Francine Shapiro later that year. And basically I was drawn to EMDR because I wanted I wanted something that was effective, efficient, and tolerable for my patients. I wanted something that was dependable and precise. Yeah. I wanted something that didn't necessarily require patients to recount the details, all of the details over and over again of their traumatic experiences, like what was required by prolonged exposure or what was called flooding at the time. Yeah, um, and I, I loved that. that EMDR integrated both um top down and bottom up work and attended to emotions, the body and people's belief systems. And I, I found it to be right off the bat, I found it to be deeply integrative and experiential. And it seemed to help people in profound ways to come to terms with their past and their present and their futures. Wow. But mostly I was drawn to it because it seemed to work better and faster than anything I had used previously. And, and as a bonus, I found the work to be intensely intimate and fascinating and rewarding. I'm going to want to get into the experience of EMDR and exactly what involved in it. But yes. I also want to uh, mention that you're the co-author on this book uh, with Michael Baldwin. Mm -hmm. So what's the history behind that collaboration? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, well, the inspiration for this book came from my co-author, Michael Baldwin. Michael spent about two years in EMDR treatment with my colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Magnavita. Who I also with... interviewed, by yeah. the way. <laughs> I was and just going to say, I bet you know Jeffrey. Uh, uh, and I'll put a link to that interview. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Right. So he, Michael was in treatment for two years with Jeffrey, dealing with symptoms related to a history of childhood abuse and neglect. And over the course of this treatment, Michael started to conjure up images associated with trauma-related concepts and the process of change. And he went looking for photographs that aligned with these images in his imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and he ultimately shared a handful of these photographs with his therapist, with Jeffrey, uh, who said, you know, Michael, I think you have the basis for a book here. <laughs> There's a lot <laughs> here. Yeah. And um, Michael started to imagine a book in which he discussed his own trauma history and his experience with EMDR. And a professional would provide the didactic part about trauma treatment, EMDR, the process of recovery. And in thinking about creating a book, Michael had the hope basically that after hearing his story and the experiences of other clients uh, discussed in a book like this, people would feel more comfortable talking about their own stories and ultimately in seeking help. So Michael contacted me and his story, his idea for a book were so compelling that mm. I couldn't resist. And yeah. I immediately uh, got excited about creating an EMBR book, unlike anything that had ever come before, right? One that my clients would actually read one that I could share with my parents who never really understood what I do for a living. Yeah. Uh, one that I could share with my primary care doctor and my chiropractor who'd been asking me questions about trauma and EMDR for years. And I just, you know, I imagined it to be a truly accessible and user-friendly book. And for me, um, writing a book like this was a way for me to combine my commitment to mental health advocacy with my love for trauma informed clinical work for te you know my love of teaching and my love of EMDR yeah so how is the book structured in terms of the collaboration what's how how what's the structure of it yeah so the book is written in two voices uh, the voice of a trauma expert, an EMDR expert, and the voice of a trauma survivor, the EMDR client. That's Michael. And Michael shares his trauma history. He talks about his symptoms, his struggles, um, his experience with the EMDR therapy. He describes the process of transformation that basically allowed him to reclaim his life. I provide an overview of trauma, post-traumatic symptoms, the process of recovery. I talk about the nuts and bolts of EMDR therapy. And I also... Um, try to convey the wonder of this therapy approach and the kind of the profound nature of the transformations that I or we 
uh, get to witness. And every chapter begins with some description, some narrative from Michael, and I follow with the didactic part and commentary kind of on his experience. Uh, I share case vignettes from my own practice throughout the book. Um, mm -hmm. Finally, there are about 60 photographs in the book, um, each accompanied by a bit of text that is explanatory or inspiring or hopefully thought provoking. Yeah. So in a sense, the book is like two books in one. It's a picture yeah. book and a textbook. Um, and some of my clients who aren't readers, who aren't yet ready to focus cognitively have really benefited from um, the story that these billboards, we call them billboards, the uh -huh. story that these billboards tell. Yeah. And it's a it's a relatively uh, easy read. It's seven chapters. You know, the first chapter is what is this thing we call trauma? The second chapter is how does trauma affect your mind, your body and behavior? Uh, the third is how does trauma affect the brain? The fourth is, you know, how does EMDR therapy, what is EMDR therapy and how does it work? Um, chapter five is called contemplating, tr contemplating treatment. Am I ready? Can I really do this? Um, mm -hmm. Where we address some of the fears and anxieties that people have about entering treatment and addressing their trauma. Um, six is entitled keeping your eye on the prize, the promise of transformation, where we talk about um what change, what transformation looks like. And Michael's really able to talk about the transformation he experienced. Yeah. And then the seventh chapter is um, called When You're Ready, Resources to Get You Started on Your EMDR Journey. And, you know, that's where we talk about how do you find an EMDR therapist? How do you interview an EMDR therapist? And then the book wraps up with all kinds of recommended resources, books, websites, etc. cetera. Wow. Um, we have the ACE questionnaire in the appendix. Um, so that's basically the structure of the book. Yeah, well, that's a very complete description. And, and it sounds like it's a very complete book. And uh, I must say that Michael's description of his of his traumatic experiences over the course of his life, it, it really wasn't just one trauma. But yeah. as he gets into his work, he discovers that there's been a lot going on yes. over the course of his life. And yes. so that's a very compelling story and one that's, I think, certain to draw people in who are, you know, examining those sorts of issues for themselves. Yes. yes. Yeah. So maybe we should jump to uh, the definition of trauma. Um, how, what's the current definition? <laughs> well, that depends who you ask. You will find many, many different definitions of what and disagreements and arguments. Um, but, you know, we know that 70% um, of adults have experienced at least one significant trauma in their lives, though only about 20% of those adults go on to develop post-traumatic stress disorder in their lives. Um, trauma is clearly a part of life. And in our book, we purposely define it quite broadly we define trauma as any experience that feels overwhelming, uh, that triggers strong negative emotions like shame or terror, and uh, involves a sense of powerlessness or uh, intense vulnerability. And what's important to note, though, is that trauma is both objective and subjective, right? It's both what happened, the event, and how a person experienced what happened, right? Your experience of the event and the response to the event. So no two people are gonna to respond to the same, uh, no two people are gonna to respond to the same event in the same way. So um, some people might tell you a story of something that happened to them that, um, that we might not think that doesn't sound so traumatic. Right. But right, you're but, saying it could be. Right. It depends on experience. their nervous system. Yeah. It depends on their psychosocial history. It depends on the meaning that they attach to what happened to them. You know, whether they see themselves as responsible for what happened. There's so many factors that play into why something might be experienced as a trauma. Okay. Okay. Right. And what we do know, too, is that the greater number of adverse experiences that someone is exposed to, the greater the potential psychological and physical toll, right? Trauma is cumulative. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, yeah. 
that it would build up somehow in Absolutely. your nervous system, in your body, et cetera. Exactly. You mentioned uh, complex trauma. Yeah. And uh, so tell us about complex tra- trauma. And I also like that you you had a section where you talked about big trauma versus little trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> let me first hit complex trauma. Um, yeah. So when we talk about complex trauma, we're talking about prolonged, repetitive, pervasive experiences, mm-hmm. traumatic experiences, and in some case, ongoing, right? Yeah. Situations where escape is often very difficult or impossible, like right? complex trauma is long lasting. It often continues or repeats over the course of months or years or even decades. Well, and like you- when, when you say that you can't get away from, that puts me in mind of a child exactly. who is born into a family where one or more members of that family are constantly belittling, attacking, undermining, exactly. et cetera. Yeah. For some people, trauma is an everyday experience when you grow up in a disfe- dysfunctional or a traumatic family. You know, usually when we're talking about uh, complex trauma, the trauma is interpersonal in nature at the hands of someone known, a family mm-hmm. member or a caregiver or a domestic partner. It typically involves attachment ruptures and relational betrayal. Um, And it often occurs at particularly vulnerable developmental stages, as you said, Mm -hmm. right? Often beginning in infancy or early childhood and potentially um, compromising a child's physical and psychological maturation. And um, it often occurs in families, but it also occurs in other closed contexts, closed contexts or Mm -hmm. systems, right? Situations that involve captivity, you know, um, Mm -hmm. situations that involve intimidation tactics or threats or coercion. Often it's intergenerational. Um, And it's important to say that it often involves direct harm or attack, what we call commission, acts of commission. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also may involve uh, neglect and abandonment, omission by those who are supposed to be protective, those who are supposed to be responsive. So um, again, as you said, when we talk about complex trauma, we're talking about childhood, sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, um, war atrocities, genocide campaigns and torture, sex trafficking, combat experiences, um, prolonged domestic violence, and neglect, deprivation, oppression, discrimination, separation from caregivers. How do you sit with that stuff as a therapist? I mean, just to hear that that list is uh, almost traumatizing. Yeah. Well, you know, I think if I didn't have tools at my disposal to help people get relief, to help people dump off the trauma and transform their lives, I think it would be traumatizing. You know, the, the vicarious traumatization that would come with sitting with somebody who you know, was dwelling in that powerlessness and that overwhelm, uh, you know, into the present and not able to get relief, I think it would take its toll on me. But I think the fact that you know that you can help. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that in order to help, we have to activate the memories of trauma Uh in in order to process them. Um, But, you know, as a trauma therapist, you learn how to take care of yourself, you learn how to have your own boundaries, you learn how to engage in self-care in between sessions, how to let things go, put things down at the end of sessions. What about big trauma versus little trauma? Mm-hmm. Have we really covered that or is there? No, no, I can say, say something about that. About that. Um, you know, in the field, people often use these terms, big T and little T, big trauma <laughs> and little trauma. Um, when people talk about big T trauma, they're mostly talking about um events that most anyone would consider traumatic, shock traumas, where the person perceives a potential threat to their survival or their survival of loved ones. So again, childhood, sexual, physical, emotional abuse, um, rape, physical assault, uh, combat related, witnessing violence as well. Little t traumas are experiences that people might not necessarily recognizes traumatic or events that might not necessarily meet the DSM criteria for a so-called trauma. So here we're talking about criticism, covert bullying, you know, experiences of betrayal, experiences involving 
humiliation um, or failure or aloneness, um, subtle microaggressions, as well as blatant discrimination or hostility related to uh, race, uh, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. Um, you know, little t examples in adulthood would be a divorce, maybe losing a job, a difficult move, yeah. or the discovery uh, that your partner's cheating on you. Um, in childhood, little t might be feeling ignored or feeling different or unable to measure up or somehow powerless to control the craziness or the chaos in your family. Um, so again, the point that I made earlier is that trauma involves both omission and commission. Omission are that situation, situations where things were supposed to happen, but they didn't, right? Situations where you weren't um, properly protected, listened to, cared for, valued. Yeah. And those, those experiences often get missed in psychotherapy. You know, clients don't recognize that what they didn't experience can chalk up to a, tra a trauma at some level and can have lasting lifelong effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just reading through the through the Michael's account and and the book, it's I kind of got in touch with things in my own life that maybe I hadn't labeled as tra as traumatic. But that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe I have to rethink that. Yeah. Um, mm. So, what's the relationship to PTSD? Yeah. yeah. So, as I said, not everyone that is, is exposed to a trauma develops PTSD. About 20% of those exposed to a trauma may develop PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, PTSD is associated with exposure to a distinct trauma or a number of distinct traumas, you know, a car accident, an assault, a natural disaster, a hurricane, earthquake, um, a domestic or community violence incident. Um, and as we're saying here, the event could actually be a big T or a small T traumas. Many factors determine whether someone's going to develop PTSD when exposed to a big T or a small T trauma. The, the three symptom clusters uh, associated with PTSD are, number one, re-experiencing traumatic events in the present in the form of recurrent nightmares, vivid flashbacks, uh, intrusive thoughts and memories. And the re-experience is often accompanied by strong and overwhelming emotions and um, physical sensations like those that were experienced at the time of the original event. And then there's a cluster of symptoms that are related to avoidance, avoidance of thoughts and memories of traumatic events or the avoidance of activities or people or places that are somehow reminiscent of the traumatic events. And the avoidance is often accompanied by um, numbing or emotional shutdown or detachment constriction in the body. And then the third um, area, the third cluster of symptoms is uh, hyperarousal symptoms, hypervigilance, sleep difficulties, uh, ag agitation, um, startle responses. A and then we have complex PTSD on top of PTSD. So again, for those that are exposed mm. to prolonged repeated trauma, um, there's an additional three symptoms uh, that get added to the symptoms of PTSD. So in addition to those classic PTSD symptoms, we see uh, severe and pervasive problems with affect regulation. So mm -hmm. difficulties with um, managing and tolerating emotions, right? Here we see explosive anger, persistent sadness or grief or depression, um, suicidal thoughts, self-injurious behaviors, problems with dissociation. Um, we see negative self-concept, which are persistent, beliefs about oneself as being worthless or diminished or defeated, somehow not good enough, um, accompanied by pervasive feelings of shame and guilt and a sense of failure. Um, and then the third additional criteria or cluster uh, are related to um, persistent difficulties in sustaining relationships and in feeling close to others. So difficulties with trust, 
uh, tendencies to idealize or devalue others in primary relationships, uh, struggles with feeling um, betrayed or struggles with uh, abandonment or loss. So that's the breakdown of PTSD and then complex PTSD. Yeah, wow, that's a lot. I, I can really believe that you are a pioneer leading workshops on this material all over the world because <laughs> you've really got it down. Um, so describe the therapy to us. Uh, <clears throat> I've never been in it. I haven't really witnessed it. I somehow mm -hmm. I have this impression, at least from the early days, of somebody maybe do, moving their finger back and forth. Uh, the therapist is moving their th finger back and forth. And uh, that yeah. sounds like voodoo, you know. What the <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, my mentor, here? Andy Sweet, said, I know it sounds wacky, but... Yeah. Um, so let me maybe start with the name of the therapy. Yeah. Uh, EMDR, EMDR stands for eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, right? It's a mouthful. Right. Um, desensitization refers to the focus on reducing fear, anxiety, and distress. Reprocessing refers to the reevaluation or the restructuring of thoughts and beliefs and the transformation of one's um, sense of self related to past traumatic experiences. Now, reprocessing leads to resolution, to healing. It allows people to move the past into the past uh, so they, they, they can live more fully in the present. Um, and then there's the eye movement part. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, EMDR was developed by psychologist Francine Shapiro in the late 80s after she accidentally discovered that moving your eyes back and forth while also foc focusing on a traumatic memory leads to a spontaneous reduction in distress, a reduction in the vividness and the emotional intensity of the memory. Um, she would ask clients to focus on a relevant traumatic memory and then would instruct them to follow her fingers with their eyes as she moved them horizontally back and forth in front of their face. Hence the name eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. And she developed an effective protocol involving eye movements and published that very first research study, as I said, uh, in 1989, she worked with um, Vietnam combat veterans and uh, rape survivors. Now, uh, three decades later, EMDR is a memory-focused, comprehensive psychotherapy. It's no longer just a technique that helps people deal with um, the impact uh, of trauma in their lives and the legacy of trauma. And it's based on the idea that, um, that uh, psychological problems are related to a failure to adequately process um, memories, traumatic experiences that are frozen and locked in the nervous system. And these unprocessed traumatic memories locked in our nervous systems continue to affect uh, how we perceive things, decisions we make, reactions we have, uh, the beliefs we hold about ourselves and others. And present day triggers uh, activate these unprocessed traumatic memories leading to symptoms that cause ongoing distress. And EMDR is, it's best known as an evidence-based uh, treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, but in fact, it's being used to effectively treat a wide range of disorders, uh, symptoms, and issues. Yeah, I was shocked even if, I don't remember off the top what year it was that I interviewed uh, Francine, but I was really surprised to learn that already, uh, I think there was a book out of, of research studies that had used EMDR in a variety of ways. Yeah, and there was already a quickly developing uh, base of of research uh, yes, that uh, that really caught my attention. yeah, and and absolutely. then, as things have evolved, though, that we've also found that there are other approaches to therapy that may use, similar ideas that not, not, don't necessarily use eye movement. I'm thinking, of course, of the tapping therapies, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. I believe that is the idea now that it has to do 
that, that these all fall under bilateral brain stimulation. We can get into the neuroscience of it a bit. Yeah, what, let's let, let's leave that for a moment, if that's okay. I, I'd sure. love to walk you through uh, an EMDR session to really give you a sense of kind of what happens over the course of a session or over the course of uh, of treatment. Okay, good. Would that be helpful? Yeah, yeah. I want to be okay. the fly on the wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So um, early sessions involve uh, taking a thorough history and coming up with a treatment plan, right? Establishing safety and trust within the therapeutic relationship and resourcing and skill building work if needed to make sure that a client is ready to approach challenging emotional material. So most people <laughs> don't show up saying, I want to work on my traumatic memories from age five or age 12, right? Most people walk through our doors and they say, I'm miserable. I'm having trouble coping. I'm having marital problems. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I have PTSD symptoms. So we often begin with the client's current distress and we float back, right? We look for the roots of the distress. We search for relevant memories to target. And once a target memory is identified, we activate the memory through a series of questions. Uh, questions like what picture represents the worst part of that memory? What's the negative belief about yourself that comes up when you bring up this memory? Like, where do you feel this in your body? What emotions come up? So we activate it through these questions. And then we introduce uh, 30 to 60 second sets of eye movements, or what we call bilateral back and forth stimulation to jumpstart and support the brain stalled information processing system. And over the years, we've discovered that other forms of what we call bilateral stimulation are also effective in reducing distress. We might have clients track our fingers with their eyes as the fingers move back and forth or track a light that moves back and forth, or we might have them listen to alternating tones through headphones, beep, 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 or we might um, tap back and forth on their hands as they rest them in their lap. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that during the pandemic, we discovered that EMDR can be done virtually without any loss of strength in the protocol. Um, but with every set of bilater bilateral stimulation, the client is asked to simply notice what changes or emerges in their mind, in their bodies, and to report images, thoughts, feelings, sensations, uh, impulses, insights, we encourage them to just notice, to be a passenger on a train, just watching the scenery go by. And um, we, we help them to stay connected to the present moment, just witnessing from a distance, right? We remind clients over and over, it's old stuff. It's just a memory. And we stress the importance with our clients of what we call dual attention, right? That is keeping one foot in the present at all times uh, while accessing the past. And after every set of bilateral stimulation, we simply ask, what do you get now? What do you notice? What's changing? And no two people are going to process in the same yeah. way. There's yeah. no, there's no supposed to, there's no shoulds. Um, we say to clients, whatever comes up, just let it come. But we work hard to make sure that they are activating that memory and focusing on that memory. And clients remember and they process, they process fear. Uh, they process grief, they process anger, guilt, and shame. We work to keep the processing body focus. Again and again, we say, where do you feel that? Just notice. And in the course of processing, a client might imagine saying or doing what they never got to previously say or do, right? Expressing their rage, running away, fighting back with superhuman strength. And a, a client might also... Um, spontaneously see their younger self and offer compassion and care and understanding. Um, with reprocessing, a client's distress eventually decreases and relative, uh, not relative, relevant adaptive information, bits of information located in other parts of the brain, helpful present day perspectives get integrated. So this idea of like, it's over. I'm safe now. I was only a kid doing the best I could. 
it wasn't actually my fault. We see these um, more positive thoughts, more positive information start to integrate in. So there are shifts in thoughts and feelings and behaviors and physical sensations. And the healing basically involves um, spontaneous movement toward more positive thinking, more manageable feelings, and a significant reduction in the level of distress experienced in one's body. And maybe the last thing I'll say about it is that it, EMDR is a comprehensive treatment. Francine used to talk about it being a three-pronged approach where we're not just working on the past events, but we're also helping people address the situations, the people, the experiences in the present that trigger their distress. We're kind of neutralizing those triggers. And ultimately, we're helping people to think about what they want for their future, who they want to be, what they want to take on, what initiatives they want to pursue. And we help them prepare for that as well. Yeah. Um, initially, well, you started out in a behavioral kind of approach to working with this stuff. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, and one could could have the mistaken impression that it's just a very mechanical approach. But as I hear you talk about it, it sounds like it really, there's not the kind of separation from other approaches to therapy that involve insight and and the relationship with the therapist. Yeah. It sounds like all Absolutely. of that comes into play. I think that's a, a myth or misinformation that's out there about EMDR, that it's somehow mechanical. Yeah. Um, at the heart of good EMDR therapy is your relationship with your therapist, uh, you know, and it's not a mechanical process, but rather a deeply intimate one, right? Yeah, it wouldn't um, be very rewarding to just be doing as a therapist, it would be rewarding to just be doing this mechanical no. thing all the time. But it's so important that our clients feel seen and heard and valued yeah. and accompanied. You know, I say, I explicitly say to my clients all the time, I'm right here with you. I'm not going to let you drown. I'm not going to get you lost. Um, you know, we as EMDR therapists, we, we, we offer to bear the pain with our clients so that they can process it, process it and heal. We make sure that they remain kind of in their window of tolerance, right? Their optimal arousal zone, helping to make sure that they stay grounded in the present at all times. We're quite interactive in that way. Um, we make sure that they're maintaining that dual attention all the way through um, so that they are, are actually witnessing these changes, not reliving the trauma. You you uh, you said that you do 20, 30 to sixty seconds of the reprocessing exercise or the bilateral brain stimulation mm -hmm. exercise. Does that repeat over and over and over again in a given session? Might there be uh, yes ten or fifteen rounds set. of that we in call a them given sets. hour? Yeah. Sets. Yeah. Yes. That's that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be 10, 15, 20 sets of bilateral stimulation I over see. the course of a session. Sometimes sets, if needed, are much longer than that as well. We're really, I'm really tracking the client as we engage in the EMDR to, to kind of watch them go up and over that arousal curve, right? We, you can kind of see it in their face in their emotions, in their body. And so sometimes the sets can be much longer, but there are many, many sets over the course, okay. uh, many sets of bilateral stimulation over the and course. That, and session. how long um, do treatments tend to be uh, in terms of the number of sessions? Well, you know, that is always an interesting uh, question uh, sure. because it completely depends, right? It completely depends who the person is, what they're coming in to work on. Um, and, uh, you know, what we know from early research is that if someone's coming in to work on a single episode adult trauma, we can knock out that PTSD in two to three sessions, maybe three to four sessions. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody's coming in with a much more complex history, um, it's going to take, you know, complex trauma 
requires much more complex therapy. And so it's going to take much, much longer. So it may be weeks, it may be months. With some clients who've had a lifetime of trauma, it could be years of therapy Mm -hmm. as well. I was I was wondering if this would have particular appeal to uh, insurers, if it, if it's shorter than av- quicker than average, you know, insurers well, these days you know, they, they want to they say okay we'll cover ten sessions, right, right, and then you get back to us and ask for more, right. I you know. Uh, in years past, when we had a hard time getting insurance companies to cover EMDR because they didn't really know what it was, the research was still relatively new. Um, you know, I would go to insurance companies and say it's almost unethical <laughs> not to cover EMDR because we're able to address people's PTSD and other trauma related symptoms yeah. in a much more efficient way. Um, And, you know, as the research has uh, progressed over the years, and now, you know, EMDR is recognized as a top tier uh, treatment for PTSD around the world by trauma uh, organizations around the world, the World Health Organization, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, the Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, you know, it's, it's, it is regarded as an evidence based uh, top tier treatment, because the research is there. So now, um, you know, we absolutely have a case in going to insurance companies and saying uh, that it's critical that they cover treatment with clients yeah. with PTSD. Yeah. So what about, you mentioned that um, about 20% of people exposed to one form of trauma or another come down with PTSD or you know, a major uh, a need need for therapy, for treatment. What's happening with the other 80%? In your, in your, in your book, you kind of emphasize that we're all built to be homeostatic organisms, right. self-regulating. So let's talk about the, what happens, let's talk about that side of it a bit. Well, for the other 80% that don't develop PTSD, I've got to assume that they have been able to process their traumatic experience in their own way with the support of other people. You know, they, they, you know, we all go through experiences on a day-to-day basis and we process through experiences and non-traumatic experiences, right? We, we go to a party, we see our friends, we make conversation, we eat good food. And that night we come home Maybe we talk with our partner about it. We reflect on the experience. Maybe we go to sleep that night. We dream about it. But by the ex- next day, we have moved that experience along and and put it up on the shelf as a past memory. That's the way most people will process through traumatic experiences as well. They'll talk about it. They'll dream about it. They'll write about it. They'll cry about it. They'll reflect on it with somebody who they feel safe with. Um, They'll read about it, read about trauma. They'll make meaning out of it and they'll move on from it. They'll find but songs, certain, that, yeah, they'll find music <laughs> right. that elicits those feelings. Right. Yeah. right. Um, so if you're lucky enough to have that support in your life to, you know, to be, to have the time and the space to process through, then you're not going to necessarily develop PTSD. But for significant traumatic experiences or prolonged chronic trauma, traumatic experiences, that trauma gets frozen or locked in the nervous system. And it gets locked in the nervous system along with all of the component parts of the trauma, the feelings, the sensations, the cognitions. And there it lies in the nervous system waiting to get reactivated when, you know, along comes a trigger um, that brings it up again, and it may activate that entire constellation of experience, right? The feelings, the sensations, the images, or it might just activate some component of it. So the the sadness, the grief, the, the terror. You know, often people don't recognize that they're having trauma-based symptoms because just the emotional parts of what they experience get activated. They don't necessarily get the images 
or the story with it, just the felt experience in them in their body or the emotions. So, um, so uh, in those cases, when those memories remain in the nervous system, you need something more than just talking about it, just reflecting on it. And that's where EMDR comes into it. Yeah. Now, some of the people I've interviewed have have gone so far to say that uh, we're all traumatized. We're all victims of trauma. And indeed, we're going through a situation right now with, co- with pandemic. Uh, I'll say pandemics because I'm not convinced that it's over. Yes, right. And... Uh, and the the uh, the global climate crisis. Uh, so there are major things that um, yes. that I think are pretty traumatizing. So I'm I'm ready to buy into the idea that we're all dealing with a certain level of trauma. Yeah. What about the people who will not come to therapy because they can't afford it, or culturally, they're uh, it's not on their radar, or or a whole array of reasons are the, are there are there self therapies or other practices that people mm-hmm. can engage in that would help them move through things without therapy well you know i think as you said we're in the midst of a mental health crisis right now And I think that there are many things that trauma survivors can do on their own to facilitate healing. Um, You know, learning something as simple as breathing and self-regulation skills, learning how to journal, learning how to use artwork um, are things that trauma survivors or, you know, even somebody that would not consider themselves a trauma survivor, but just somebody who's having a hard time with the stressors of our world, like you said, as we're all feeling anxiety about climate change, about the pandemic. Um, there are many things that we can do that um, that help us to process through those feelings, process through uh, the material that's somehow stuck and lingering in our nervous system. Um, what's really nice is there seems to be some kind of trauma recovery conference or healing from trauma and PTSD summit being offered online almost every week these days. Many of them are free or very, very low cost. They have many speakers with lots of different kinds of interventions offered to um, those that have been affected by trauma. Um, And there are many, many outstanding self-help books that can guide survivors in their healing journey, you know, offering valuable psychoeducation, and an introduction to coping skills and exercises that offer a lot of benefits um, on our website, um, which is uh, everymemorydeservesrespect.com. Um, we have a, a whole list of books and websites that are useful, that are potentially useful to trauma survivors. Um, but I will say um, that uh, I, I think to achieve long lasting and comprehensive transformation, traumatic memories must be activated and processed. You know, So for those folks that aren't finding um, themselves able to move on, carry on with their day-to-day um, activities, you know, that really are plagued by the symptoms of PTSD, we have to get at those traumatic memories and they have to be processed. And for this um, component of one's healing journey, I think it's critical to work with a well-trained trauma trauma-informed therapist. You know, and of course, <laughs> I would recommend uh, working with a therapist trained and experienced in EMDR. But um, but I think the important thing is to say there's a lot that you can do on your own. But when you're not getting the relief you're looking for, uh, it's really critical to find someone to help you with that piece. Well, this has been a very educational session here, and uh, I've learned a lot. I'm sure my audience has learned a lot. And so I really want to thank you, Dr. Deborah uh, Deborah Korn, for being my guest today on Shrinkwrap Radio. Thank you so much, David. It's an absolute pleasure talking with you.